Peace and holiness coming to you on behalf of Peaceful Holiness Church, Philadelphia, broadcasting live from Ghana, the foothills of Zion. This is uh, Minister Malcolm Khalid. Just want to give glory and honor to the Heavenly Father and to the Son, the Holy Son, the Word of God that was sent to the earth, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yahshua HaMashiach. And we're coming today out of different scriptures. We're going to start off with the second beast, Revelations chapter 13, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now, this second beast is the false prophet, the chief religious figure in the world during the tribulation years, and is identified in the scriptures as the second beast. He will apparently be a Jew, influential in religious affairs, motivated by Satan, having authority delegated to him, promoting the worship of the Antichrist, authenticate, authenticating his ministry with signs and wonders, successfully deceiving the unbelieving world, promoting idolatrous worship like those of Sabaism that practice Sabaism and call themselves Sabaeans, worshiping the whole heavenly host. That's idolatrous worship. It talks about that in Zephaniah uh, chapter 1 verse 5. It says those who worship on the housetops and those who worship and swear by Malcolm. It talks about that. This beast, the second beast, also known as the false prophet, will have power over death, having authority over commerce and having an identifying physical mark. Now, as the father sent the son so will Satan send the Antichrist. As the Son sends the Holy Spirit to accomplish his purpose, so will the false prophet carry out the program of the Antichrist. Christians should recognize Satan's attempts to minimize the plans and people of the Godhead and therefore should guard themselves with scriptural doctrine, biblical doctrine. And one reference that... uh. That you can refer to, that will refer to is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9. And I quote, and it says, Even him whose coming is after the works, the workings of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, all deceivableness, deceiving, the very elect will be deceived. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, not righteousness, unrighteousness, and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. They shall believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believeth not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. B, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. Amen. To the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which have loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen. That's coming out of 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians uh, verses 9 through 17. Amen. It said, let's, let's recap that. It says, it talked about the gospel. Verse 14, whereunto he called you by our gospel. To the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
You got false prophets out here that's trying to usurp Jesus Christ. That's putting them place, that's putting themselves themselves in the place of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's putting themselves above the Lord Jesus Christ. That's putting Jesus Christ under themselves. You got brothers that's doing this in the world right now. Right now, false prophets. I shouldn't even be calling them brothers. False prophets, which is the second beast. It said in verse 11 of Revelation chapter 13, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. Verse 12, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, remember, Ronald Reagan, he was wounded real bad and he opened up the Church of Satan June 6, 1966 in California. And Ronald Reagan, during this time, he was he's that first beast that the scripture is talking about. And the the uh, the, the devil having a, uh, the devil also having authority, amen, will send the Antichrist. As the son sends the Holy Spirit to accomplish his purpose, so will the false prophet carry out the program of the Antichrist. As we spoke in one of our last discussions, one of our last sermons, one of our last lessons, one of our last uh, uh, doctors that we, we was teaching on, that Damien, they made a movie called Rosemary's Baby, where Damien was born in that movie in the Dakota House, which is in New York. In June, on June 6, 1966, and this was the devil's son. Amen. So you had the first beast who's who who says in verse 12, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed, as Ronald Reagan was healed from his deadly wound. Research uh, the wound that he had. I, if I'm not mistaken, it was a gunshot wound that he was healed from. Verse 13. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Verse 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles. He had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Amen. Verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. All throughout Africa, they have images of white Jesus. And we know that Jesus was not white. We know that Jesus was not white. And we're going to, we're going to get to, we're going to get to, to that as well. But if you go into Revelations chapter one, verses 12 through 14, you'll see the description of the Messiah Jesus. It said that he had hair like lamb's wool. It said that his skin, that the feet, the color of his feet was like fine brass, which is 50% copper and 50% zinc. And then it said, burnt into a furnace, like fine brass burnt into a furnace. So that's blacking. Fine brass burnt into a furnace is black. That means his feet was black. And your feet is the same color as your head. Your feet, from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet, your body is usually the same complexion. So it gave a description of him having hair like wool, which only Africans have hair like wool. Only the African race has hair that defies gravity. Where you pick it, it will stand up. Indians don't have hair like wool. Chinese, Asians don't have hair like wool. Caucasians, Europeans don't have hair like wool. Only the African race has hair like wool. Has hair like lamb's wool. Amen. And he had, verse 13, verse 15, excuse me. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Verse 16. And he causes all 
both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. And when they was forcing people all around the world to get the vaccination for the coronavirus, that vaccination that they had had a, a enzyme in it called Luf Lucifer Ace. And that Lucifer Ace had the number 666 within it. And they were forcing this for people to get this mark. You couldn't even work. You couldn't even get a job unless you had the coronavirus shot. But there were ways around it. There were ways around it. You had to get out. You had to one come out, out of those big cities. You had to come out of Babylon, as it says in Revelations 18, chapter uh, chapter 18, verses one through four. Come out of her, my people, so you don't partake of the sins of her, for her iniquities have reached the heavens. So Babylon, we know, is America. We know is the great harlot. You had the harlot, and you you had the harlot, and then you have the bride. The bride of Christ will come out of heaven adorned, which is the New Jerusalem which will be the abode of peace for the immortal saints, all the saints that will be raptured up into the new Jerusalem. This is the bride of Christ. Amen. And he, verse 16, and he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell save that he had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Amen. Verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is six hundred and three score and six. That's six, six, six. Now, Drake, the rapper Drake, which is a derivative of Draconian or Draconian, uh, which the draconians, they seek to control the world through sex, lust, and pleasures. Drake's music is very uh, lustful, very uh, seductive sexually, and he calls himself the sixth god. So we already know that, and he's supposed to be a Jew. Drake is supposed to be a Jewish man. He's a Jewish man, and he has controlled the masses with his music. Okay? Now... Let's break these verses down. 13, chapter 13 of Revelations. Chapters 13 of Revelations, verses 11 and 12. The second beast is the false prophet. We know that. Whose role is to bring people to worship the first beast. He is a deceiver. His two horns, like a lamb, represents an attempt to give the impression of gentle harmlessness. Amen. Matthew 7, 15. His dragon speech depicts his empowerment by Satan. His dragon speech as the draconians is the dragon man. And as his speech is seductive and full of lust and pleasure. Amen. He is given full exercise of the power of the first beast who is the political, who is the political ruler. His priestly role identifies him as a religious power or leader. He promotes global worship of the Antichrist, such as the likes of the Pope, how the Pope, he comes. He's a, he's a figure to, to look at as a, as, a, you know, as a false prophet as well. And then verses 13 through 15, the, pro, the false prophet deceiveth the unbelievers of the earth by means of wonders and miracles. And you can refer to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. Mark, the gospel of Mark chapter 13, verse 22. Second Thessalonians, which we uh, just read, uh, chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Accomplished through satanic power, he will produce the miracles of Elijah, the prophet Elijah. Refer to 1 Kings chapter 18, 38. And 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 10. Remember, Elijah commanded fire to come down from heaven and he destroyed a captain of 50. 
He said, if I be if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and destroy you. And fire came down from heaven and consumed the captain and his 50 men. Now, the ability of the image to speak is a satanic miracle. The people of the earth must either worship the image of the beast or be killed. There will be no room in the beast's empire for religious freedom. Amen. Verse 13, 16 through 18. Verses 16 through 18. Now, recap. Only unbelievers will receive the mark of the beast. You hear that? Only unbelievers will receive the mark of the beast because the saints, the saints of God, the saints, <laughs> they will have their father's name written in their foreheads. Amen. The mark will be placed either on the right hand or on the forehead. Both very visible places. No one will be able to buy or sell anything without having thus submitted to the political and religious system of the beast. Now, the Greek word for mark is chara, charagma, charagma. That's the, that's the Greek word for mark. And is used to describe an image or stamp or brand or other marks. And you can refer to Acts chapter 17, verse 29. According to verse 17, the mark of the beast may be the name of the image of the beast or the person or the empire. The number of the beast's name is 666, right? Like, uh, what was that? Bill Gates, his computer had 666, the IBM, when he came out with that. Or an image or other representation of the beast. You can also refer to the third Maccabees, Maccabees 3. Maccabees 3, 229. Amen. The number of the beast is 666. The number of man, as Drake calls himself the sixth God. And he's also a Jew. So he's also a, a lion, a lion false prophet. But he may not be the false prophet that the scriptures is talking about. Now, the Greek word for man or mankind is anthropos. Anthropos, Anthropos, the number may be the number of imperfection or humanity as 666, the evil trinity, rather than 777, the holy trinity. Also, 888 is numerical phiusis, which is Jesus, and a number representing the Antichrist's name, which will be recognized by believers during the tribulation period or a number derived from the Hebrew spelling Caesar, Nero, Khazar, Neron, who prefigured the Antichrist in his evil actions. When you go into Daniel 8, you can refer to Antiochus or Antiochus Epiphanes, which was in Daniel chapter 8. Amen. So moving right along. That, that subject right there, that's the second beast, which is the false prophet. So, let's move right along. I have something to share with you. Now, now remember, Jesus said, upon this rock, he said, upon this rock, I build my church. Amen. Let's move into Matthew chapter 16. Now, chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippe, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say, that thou art John the Baptist. Some, Elijah. 
In others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Verse 15. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Jesus is telling me, okay, you, you say, you're telling me what other people told you, but I'm asking you, I'm asking you. I'm not asking who, you know what I'm saying? I'm asking, who do you say I am? Amen. Now this is what I'm asking you. But whom do you say that I am? Whom say ye that I am? And it was Simon Peter. And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah. That word bar, pay attention. That word bar, it means son. So when you say Simon bar Jonah, that's saying Simon, son of Jonah. And Jesus answered, verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Amen. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys, and I will give unto thee the keys of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven amen so that's serious right there you see the coast of Caesarea in verses uh, 13 and going through 17 this was a town in the extreme northeast of Galilee near the source of the Jordan verse 14 Public opinion placed on Jesus, our Lord, on the highest human pedestal by identifying him with one of the na national heralds of the past, John the Baptist. Herod himself was a victim of this particular superstition. We know that he was held in high esteem as a prophet by the people. Thou art the Christ. Simon Peter recognize and acknowledge openly the Lord's deity. He may have been speaking for all the disciples. It was a conviction they all now shared. Peter, Peter further used the Greek defin definite article, the, to designate that Jesus was the son of the living God. Now, verse 16, the son of God, when the expression son of God is used concerning Christ, it delineates the relationship between the first two members of the Trinity. The Hebrew expression, the son of implies one with the same nature as the father. In this sense, there is no real difference between the son of God and God, the son. Both emphasize the deity of Christ and his unique relationship with the Father. Amen. When Jesus identified God as his Father, implying that he was the Son of God, the Jews understood this as a claim to deity. Refer to John chapter 5, verse 18. When Peter identified Jesus as the Son of the living God, in verse 16, it was the result of spiritual insight. That was the Holy Spirit at work. The Spirit of the Lord. The Father had revealed this to him. As we become increasingly intimate with Christ, we should also become increasingly aware that Jesus is the Son of God. Refer to Psalms chapter 2 verse 7. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! In Matthew 16, 16, this is the very first reference. And then you have John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish and have everlasting life. Amen. In verse 13, let's 
Recap verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Felipe, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I am the son of man? Excuse me. Let me read that again. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Felipe, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man am? So he asked his disciples, he's asking them, who do men say that I am? So that's why they answered and said, well, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some say John the Baptist. Then he re then he uh, revised that question and reiterated that question and said, but whom say ye that I am? But, so he's asking them, but who, but who do you all, my disciples, my, who do you all say that I am? And that's when Peter came about and answered from him and answered the question and said, for thou, art, for, for thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And that's when Jesus said, blessed are thou, Simon Bar Jesus, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. Amen. Now, Caesar, Caesarea Felipe was a Greek town. It was northeastern or northern most region of Palestine, 120 miles north of Jerusalem, 50 miles west, southwest of Damascus, Damascus. Situated in a beautiful location at the foot of Mount Hermon and the headwaters of the Jordan River. It had been called Panias, honoring the Greek god Pan. So you see, it was, it was named after an idol, uh, you know, a false god, you see. Herod the Great built a marble temple there to Caesar Augustus. Herod's son, Philip, tit, tit, uh, Herod's son, Philip Tetrarch, further adorned the city and renamed it in honor of Caesar. To distinguish it from the city of the coast, he identified it as Philip, hence Caesarea Philip, Felipe. This city is mentioned only twice in the New Testament, both passages relating to Peter's great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Amen. As you see in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 16, you can also refer to uh, the gospel of Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 29. The transfiguration of Christ probably took place on the nearby slopes of Mount Hermon. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 13. The Greek name is preserved in the present Syrian town of 9,000 named Benias. Now, now, moving right along, because we want, we want, we want to, now you see, now you see uh, verse 18 of, of Matthew chapter 16, and, and this is what Jesus said. Jesus said in verse 18 of chapter 16 of Matthew, and I say unto you, and I say also unto you, thou, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The Greek word used for rock is Petra. The Greek word is Petra. Almost sounds like Peter. Peter. Petra. Is played against the name Peter. You see? Petros. Some use this passage to teach that Peter was the foundation stone of the church. That he had primacy or primacy among the apostles. And that he became bishop of Rome as Christ is the bishop of our souls and the mediator of man. The verse will scarcely bear the first of these pro propositions and certainly none of the others. Peter may be meant by the rock, but he is not the exclusive foundation for the 12 fold foundation of the apostles of the church. See Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 and Revelation chapter 21 verse 14, which we discussed yesterday. Uh, that's titled New Jerusalem, Rapture, the 100 year, the seven year, seven years of tribulation and the 1000 year millennial kingdom. That's that's what that's titled under. And we went into Revelation chapter 21 and we also went into First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, this seems born out of by the fact that the same words are spoken to all disciples in Matthew 18, chapter 18, excuse me, chapter 18, verse 18, as are spoken to 
Simon Peter in Matthew 16, 19. Therefore, the rock or foundation of the church is the confession, ultimately the doctrine of the apostles, which became normative for the true church. The word here translated church, ecclesia, ecclesia. So that's the Greek word for church, ecclesia. It literally means a chosen or called out assembly. As Peter in 1 Peter 2, 9, he says that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a, 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 a peculiar people, you know, a chosen generation. Excuse me. He says, he says in um, 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, you are Christians are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Uh, excuse me. He said a chosen generation, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. This is what Peter says. Peter was the rock in which the church was built on. Amen. Thus, the use of the word as a technical term for an assembly or group of believers in Christ was quite natural. It is not viewed as an external organization, denomination, or hierarchical system. Amen. The, the New Testament church, therefore, is a local autonomous congregation or assembly of believers, which is a church in and of itself. This is the first occurrence of the world in the New Testament. Since the commission in Matthew 10 sent the apostles only to the house of Israel. You see, so this is where some of the false teachers says that, you know, Jesus was only sent, only sent his uh, apostles to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So where did Paul go going to the Gentiles? That was the first commission when they were disciples. But when they became apostles, as you read in Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20, he says, Go ye therefore to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then when that was acted out at the Pentecost, you see Peter and Acts chapter 2 verse 38 he says repent and be baptized all of you in the name of Jesus Christ so he didn't say be baptized in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Ghost as Jesus originally taught in Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 through 20 when it was actually acted out when it was actually being done he said the formula because the power is in the name so it's necessary that you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ because there's power in the name if you don't know the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Ghost then the formula won't be acted out right it, you, it, you have to activate the formula it's the actual formula and that formula is Jesus Christ so you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ that is the formula that you may uh, obtain salvation and mercy and obtain the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is a gift that comes down to those who obey the Lord's commandments, Jehovah's commandments, Yahweh's commandments, the Most High's commandments, as it says in Acts 5.38. Amen. And no further commission was given until chapter 28. As I, as I just said, there was, there were, there was no worldwide task for the disciples until the physical manifestation of the church on the day of Pentecost. Jesus promises that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. The phrase shall not prevail should be understood as meaning shall not stand against. The imagery would then picture the church as being on the offensive against the gates of hell. Here hell the word hell for, in Greek is Hades. As Jesus Christ, when he was crucified on the cross and he died, he went into Hades and led the captives free. And the saints which slept in Christ, the, slain, the saints who died in righteousness, they arose out of their graves and went into the holy city. They went into the new Jerusalem. Now, Hades is the kingdom of Satan. Satan has his kingdom, which is Hades. It's not just death and the grave he has an actual kingdom and christ went into the kingdom of satan he went into the depths of hell he went into hades and he led those souls that was in that was in that was in hades a form of a form of purgatory hell not the lake of fire of eternal hell where you where some some of the sinner souls will burn eternally but 
the kingdom of Satan, which is Hades, which is in the lower parts of the earth, which is the kingdom of Satan, which is where Christ went when he died. Christ went into the into Hades and he led the captives, those that was trapped in bondage, those who had not entered the ark of Noah that died in the flood. Christ led them up and took them up with him. And also those that those saints that slept in the earth. It talks about when Christ comes back again and the, when a rapture happens before the seven year tribulation, that those saints which slept in Christ, they will be resurrected and they will rise from their graves. The dead will come out of the graves again and they will go into the holy city, the new Jerusalem. So my grandfather, Curtis C. Smith, pastor of Peaceful Holiness Church, Philadelphia, I expect to see him in the new Jerusalem. Amen. Hallelujah. I expect to see my grandfather in the new Jerusalem. Like David said, when his baby was sick and died, he said, I cannot go to him. He cannot come to me, but I will go to him. David had faith that he would see his son again from Bathsheba. That first, the first uh, son that he had that was sickly because of the, the, uh, the, the law that was broken of adultery and, and going outside of the Israelites. He had, he had, uh, created a, a act of abomination against the law of Jehovah, the law of Yahweh. So he fasted the whole time that his baby was sick. His baby infant was sick. But as soon as the baby, his baby infant died, the brother of Solomon, as soon as he died, he broke his fast. Amen. But he had faith that he will see him again because all babies, all the babies, and even during the rapture, all when the rapture happens, all those babies who are innocent will be taken up. They will be taken up. And it talks about this in Isaiah chapter 65. The babies, they, they, they will pull the lions by the beard. The lions will be peaceful. The lion will lay with the lamb in Isaiah chapter 65. We'll, we'll get to it. Don't worry. It talks about that. So all, all babies will, you know, you know, Christ says, suffer not the kingdom of heaven for, for, for suffer not the babies for theirs is given to the kingdom of heaven. So children, all those children that was aborted, all babies who have died, Christ is keeping them. And they will they will be in the thousand uh, year millennium and they will grow up in the millennium. And at 100 years old, they will be still considered babies. This is what it says in, in the prophet Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 65. Amen. Now, while Jesus' resurrection certainly will overcome the sting of death, it will also enable his church to aggressively and offensively attack the gates of hell like I'm doing right now. I'm attacking the gates of hell with the word of God. Amen. Now, usage of Satan's kingdom is you can find that in Job chapter 38, 17, Isaiah chapter 38, verse 10, Psalms 107, verse 18. David said in the Psalms, if I make my bed in hell, will you not be there? David was prophesying. Because those who, who were in hell, who had to sleep in hell, you know, in the purgatory place, in that, in that kingdom of Satan, Christ came and took them up. He led the captives free. You know what I'm saying? Christ paid the price. So we owe him our life. Amen. And if you want to go into the holy city, if you want to be raptured up, if you want to be snatched up into the new Jerusalem, into the holy city, that's a lifetime opportunity. Amen. And you're going to have to spend your life time for that opportunity because that's a opportunity of a lifetime amen so you'll have to spend your lifetime for that opportunity because this is because it is an opportunity of a lifetime amen hallelujah hallelujah Bob now snatching out victims from darkness into his glorious kingdom of light amen this is what I just was talking about snatching victims from darkness into his glorious kingdom of light. When Christ came after he was resurrected and died on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ came with having all authority and, and all power that was given to him by his father. He went into the depths of Hades. He went to the kingdom of Satan and snatched those souls and brought them up into the glorious kingdom of light. Amen. Now, the church is on the offensive here and hell is on the defensive. You know what I'm saying? They, they always said uh, offense sells tickets, but defense wins games. But right now, hell is on the defense and hell and the gates of hell will not prevail. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Now, this brings us to our next section.
that we're going to deal with. Because as you see, let's, let's read this one more time. Verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Now Peter, now the church was built off the rock, which is Peter. Amen. And Peter was a black man. So the church, the church was built off a black man. Amen. And I'm going to prove that to you. Follow me in your Bible. Follow me in the word of God. Now turn to Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now this is Paul's first missionary journey. Verse 13, verse 1. I'm going to prove to you that the church was built on a black man. Amen. Now Matthew 16, verse 19 Let's read it one more time. He says, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock, talking about Peter, which also means rock in Greek, I will build my church. So the church was built on the rock, which is Peter. That's why Peter gave the first sermon in the book of Acts. Now, when you go to when you go to Acts chapter 13, verse one, it says now. There were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simon that was called Nigger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaean, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, the Tetrarch and Saul, who later became Paul, who was sent to the Gentiles. So right there in the book of Acts, chap chapter 13, verse 1, you see Simon was called nigger. Just like I was called and most of my brothers and sisters in America are called niggers. Amen. So the church was built off a nigger, which is which was Peter was called Simon Peter the nigger. Now in Ethiopia. Amen. They have something called the Kibra Nagast, which is Ethiopian kings. The word Niga also is coming from the Aramic word, which actually means a king or someone who is of a royal priesthood or someone that is skilled with the word of God, a follower of Christ. But they but the but the but the beast of Babylon, the Caucasian, the beast who enslaved us, they took the word nigger and made it something that was derogatory. But you see right here that Peter, Simon Peter, is called nigger right in Acts 13.1. I ain't making this up. Go look in your Bible. Go get yourself a King James Bible because every time they give a different version of the Bible, they switch it up. They might hide the word nigger. But if you go with a King James uh, Bible, you'll see it. It says, now there were in the church that was at Antioch. Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simon that was called nigger, N-I-G-E-R. Now we use, we spell the word nigger, N-I-G-G-E-R, but it's the same word. You can say that's Niger, Simon that was called Niger. That's, that's, that's the word nigger. It means black. So the church was built off a black man. Hallelujah. The church was built off a black man. Amen. So those, all those African Americans, all, all my people in America that's called niggas, don't, don't sweat it. Don't worry about it because the church was built off a black man who was also called a nigger. And that's Simon Peter. Amen. He was the first one to confirm and, and who was convicted, who gave, who gave, who gave the confirmation, who testified that Jesus is the son of the living God. Amen. This is what Peter said. And the church was built off of him, Simon Peter. Who was called the nigger. Amen. Now it's three factors that demonstrate the shift that takes place in chapters 13. 1. The spread of the gospel. In the earlier chapters was often the result of persecution. Now it becomes the result of a programmed mission. Amen. As the evangelism spreads to the Gentiles. The focus passes from Peter to Paul. Amen. 
Likewise, the base of operations passes from Jerusalem to Antioch of Syria. Amen. Antioch was the capital of the province of Syria and the third largest city within the empire. Being surpassed only by Rome of Alexandria and Alexandria, excuse me. It was a cosmopolitan and commercial center. The list of men who are called, who are leaders in the church at Antioch represent the wide spectrum within society. From Simon called nigger, which means black, the black, to Menaean, the boyhood companion of Herod Antipas, Ant Antipas. Simon may be the man who carried Christ's cross. Mark 15, 21, Luke 23, 26, called Simon of Cyrene, North Africa. Men from Cyrene had begun the ministry among the Gentiles in Antioch. But we know that Simon Peter is who the church was built off of. And this Peter, this Simon, was referring to Peter as Simon is the surname of Peter, who was the son of Jonah, Simon Bar Jonah, as he is called, as that's what Jesus referred to him as. Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this, but my father, which are in heaven. Amen. Verse two, as they ministered, to the Lord and fasted. That's why it's important to fast. I put out a sermon uh, where we came out of uh, came out of the scripture, uh, uh, chapter two of uh, came out of what, what was that? I think that was Joel. We came out of Joel chapter two, and it was uh, it was concerning a call to fasting and repentance, or a call to repentance and fasting. That's the title of it. On YouTube, on my YouTube channel, Ink Pen Guardian. So you can follow these sermons that the Holy Spirit is, is giving utterance and, 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 and speaking. Amen. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, verse 2, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas, and Saul. Amen. For the work whereunto I have called them. And when, verse 3, and when they had fasted and prayed, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Amen. Verse 4. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. It was the Holy Ghost that led me to come to Ghana. Amen. That's why I'm here now. Verse 5. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. That's John the beloved. John the brother of James. Amen. And when they had gone through the Isles of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar Jesus. Bar means son. So if you say Bar Jesus, that's son of Jesus. Verse 7, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who's called, who called for Bar, Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Now, that, it said that he was a prudent man. Amen. But you see in Matthew chapter 25, verse 25, chapter 11, it says in and at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou has hid these things from the wise and the prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Luke chapter 22, verse 42, John eleven forty one, First 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 29. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me. Of my father and no man knoweth the son but the father neither knoweth any man the father save the son and he to whom soever the son will reveal him Matthew 28 18 
John 3, 35, 13, 3, 17, 2, John 10, 15. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Amen. For I am meek, humble, and lowly in heart, having humility. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. Those that rest in Jesus, that sleep in Jesus, they will raise out of their graves and go into the holy city at the rapture. The rapture can happen at any moment. So you have to get your soul right unless you want to be left behind in that seven years of tribulation. I remember my grandmother, Pastor Troy Lee Smith, she had a movie called Left Behind that she had me watch. And it scared the bejesus out of me. I mean, I was so scared of that movie. You know what I'm saying? I watched that movie as a child. I was about like nine years old. I got the message. I got that message. That was Grandma and Pastor Troy. Grandma and Pastor. She had me watch that movie. It was called Left Behind. And it was about uh, those people who had suddenly disappeared. And all, you know, because they was taken up in a rapture, it, it will happen in, at the twinkling of an eye. There will be two in the field. One will be taken. One will be left. And then after the rapture, you know, they will be caught up in the air. First Thessalonians four, chapter four, verse 17. They will be caught up in the clouds with Christ. Amen. And those that was left behind was left behind for seven years of tribulation on the earth that had never been seen before and never will be seen again. Such a time like that. I don't want to be left behind. And trust me, you don't want to be left behind either. So get your soul right. When I saw that movie, that was a wake-up call. That was, a, that was my wake-up call. But it was, you know, it said that the very elect will be deceived. I had been deceived by false, false teachers, master deceivers, those who try to usurp Jesus Christ and blaspheme against the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. It said, blaspheme against the Father will be forgiven. Blaspheme against the Son will be forgiven. But blaspheme against the Holy Ghost will not be forgiven. Amen. Verse 30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 1 John 5, 3. So that's rest for the weary. Coming out of uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through, through 30. So we were... Uh, in verse 7 now of Acts chapter 13, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Eliamus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. So you always got devils on the sideline trying to uh, mess up, mess up the, your, your salvation, trying to take away uh, what, what is rightfully yours, what, what, is, what is for you to have, that salvation of Christ. There were sorcerers on the side. You got, always got somebody on the side, whether there's witches, you know, sorcerers, all, all the time. You always got devils trying to mess up the ministry. Amen. Then Saul, who also was called Paul, verse 9. Filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Now, Paul is, Paul, his, you know, he got the Holy Ghost on him. You understand what I'm saying? Paul is filled with the Holy Ghost. He's filled with the Spirit of the Lord. So he fixed his eyes on his sorcerer. He's looking at him with the cold stone Steve Austin face. You know what I'm saying? He's looking at him like, look, you know what? I done had enough. You know what I mean? Paul was looking at him like this. Paul had set his eyes on him. Verse 10. And said, oh, and, and this is what Paul says, and said, O fool of subtly, 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 subtlety, and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Woo! Paul spit out fire at him. You understand what I'm saying? Paul spit fire out at him. Hallelujah. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. And this is what came out. This is what the Holy Ghost gave utterance to. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. So Paul had cursed him. The Holy Ghost had cursed him. He said, you won't see the sun for a season. 
a whole season you're going to be blind for playing with this ministry. You want to play with somebody's salvation. Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost. That's why, that's why certain false master teachers like Dr. York is in prison now because they perverted the right ways of the Lord. They perverted the right ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. They blasphemed against the Lord Jesus Christ. They tried to usurp the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why thus they sentenced to 135 years and they 20 years in. That's why. You know what I'm saying? Because when you, when you read in Daniel chapter 13, you got to go into the Apocrypha because not in the King James Bible. But when you go into the Apocrypha, Daniel chapter 13, there's a sister named Susanna. Who was accused by two false elders. You had elders. They had just became elders. And they lusted after Susanna. And they had lusted after her so much. That one time she was bathing in her husband's garden. And they went to go try to seduce her. To, to copulate with her. To fornicate with her. To make her commit adultery. Because she was a wife. And she said the Lord seeth all things. They actually, they actually decided to blackmail her. Or black female her. And um, as the word is called blackmail, and they and they said if you if you don't have if you don't copulate with us, if you don't have sex with us, that we will accuse you. And we elders, so they're gonna believe us. And said that we'll we'll say that you we caught you with a young man and that he escaped. And that's exactly what they did. But when Daniel heard the story, the young Daniel, the Holy Spirit came on Daniel, the Spirit of the Lord came on Daniel, and Daniel cross-examined. Both of the two elders separately and found them out to be liars. They was about to have this uh, sister get killed, Susanna. And Sudan Susanna, she looked up to heaven and she raised up her voice and she said, Lord, who seeth all things. Oh, Lord. And, and the Lord heard. The Lord hears the truth. The Lord sees. The Lord, his eyes is brighter than 10,000 suns. His, eye, his eyes is brighter than 10,000 suns. That that's what it says in uh, one of the scriptures. The eyes of the Lord is ten times, ten thousand times brighter than the sun. He sees all things. You understand what I'm saying? He seeth all things. So if this man, Doctor York, was innocent, he don't need no petition for you to sign for him to get out of jail. The Lord will release him out of jail if he truly was innocent. He has to get his right, his soul right with the Lord because he has blasphemed against the Holy Ghost. He has tried to usurp Jesus Christ. He has tried to put himself on a pedestal higher than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we know at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Amen. Verse 11. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. And thou shalt be blind and seeing the sun and not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist of darkness. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. When I was 25 years old, about 10 years ago, I'm 35 now, I'll be 36 in 17 days, in less than 17 days on the 17th. And I, it was, I, had, I went blind for almost one whole month. I went blind. And the doctor said that it was something called, what was the word? They said a lot of African-American males uh, suffer from it. I forget the name that they called it. It was a name that they called it, but you can look up. You can look it up. Look up a, a blind disease that African American males receive, and I and this fell on me for one month. And I and my mother prayed, and and she prayed for me and prayed for me, and and the veils was removed from my eyes. The veil was removed. So I thank God for that because I, I thought I was gonna be blind permanently. I had to wear glasses. I couldn't even. Uh, I couldn't even um, have no no light, I, certain light. I couldn't regular fluorescent uh, incandescent light. I couldn't. It, it hurt my it, it hurt my brain. It hurt my head. So I had to wear glasses just to protect my eyes. And the doctor, I went to the doctor to see the eye doctor, the ophthalmologist or the optometrist, and um, they they put you know these iodine drops in my eyes, and and it started to help. But this was after a whole month of prayer. You know, 30 days of prayer. The moon, the moon went around the whole planet one time by the time that my eyes came back. And I thank the Lord Jesus Christ that he brought my sight back. Because he he wanted me to, it was something that he was showing me, and he wanted me to see it. So he had to he had to take away my sight so I can so I can see it in the spirit. Amen. Just like when Paul was blinded, when Paul was blinded by the light, when he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus and he was blinded. For I think three days he was blinded. Or maybe longer than that. 
And Ananias had came and um, laid hands on him and prayed for him and baptized him. And he received his sight. Amen. And he was filled with the Holy Ghost from that time on. And, and he was a, he was fanatical for Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. He was fanatical like Fred Hammond's song. Fred Hammond got a whole concert. It's called, uh, it's called Radical for Christ. And Paul was radical for Christ. He had to be, he, you had, you got to be radical for Christ when you, when you being sent out to heathens and Gentiles because he, G, heathens and Gentiles are radical. I'm about to say Jeathens, which is a, a, which would be a Gentiles and heathens put together. But you know, the heathens and the Gentiles, they are, they are a radical people. So you got to be radical for Christ in order to save that kind of people. These are the kind of people that just, you know, they piss, piss all on the wall, piss out in the open, just go to bath from anywhere. They don't, you know, this is heathenistic type of practices. This type of things you see in, in all throughout Africa. You know what I'm saying? So we got to, we got to, we got to rise our people up in Christ. Amen. Verse 11, and now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Verse 12, then the deputy, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Verse 13, in, in closing that, that section. Now, when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, Pamphylia, and John, that's John the beloved, John the son of Zebedee, John the brother of James, John one of the sons of thunder, John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. Because John was like, look, I ain't about to be going to these Gentiles you know what I'm saying? You know, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't, I'm going to let you go on ahead. I'm going back to Jerusalem. That's where John was at with it. You know what I mean? Amen. Now, let's, let's recap these, uh, these, these, uh, these verses. We're coming out of chapter 13 of the book of Acts. We wanted to highlight how the, the church was built off a black man, which is Simon Peter. As Simon called, Simon who was called the nigger. Amen. And, um. Let's go. Let's let's recap. Now, uh, let's see. Let's see the commissioning of Barnabas and Saul for the missionary endeavor was the work of the Holy Spirit, as you see. You see in that verse, it says, verse two, and they ministered. Acts chapter two, verse thirteen. Excuse me. Acts chapter thirteen, verse two, as they ministered to the Lord. And fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So you see, Paul and Barnabas, which was one of the original 12 disciples, they were separated by the word of the Holy Ghost. It was the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost said, the Holy Ghost said, you see, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And those three that separated to do that work was John, was Barnabas, and was Saul. So the Holy Ghost said to John, separate me, which is the me, that me is John, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So this was this is the commissioning in verses two through four. This is commissioning of Barnabas and Saul. John was already commissioned. You know what I'm saying? And Barnabas was already commissioned. And Saul was Saul had been commissioned. So all three of them was already commissioned. But this is a this is this is commissioning them for their missionary endeavor as they start to go into the different uh, 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 places of the Gentiles. Missionary work. Amen. So the Holy Spirit most likely spoke through one of the prophets. That was John. Amen. There were prophets within this group, and that was the usual means of communicating the Spirit's message. Amen. 1 Corinthians 14. You see, 1 Corinthians 14 is a reference point which talks about speaking in tongues, the spirit of tongues, and the spirit of prophecy. 
And in there, Paul speaks how it was actually better to prophesy than it is to speak in tongues. This is what chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians is, is talking about. Because no one knows what you're saying when you're speaking in tongues. So if you, you know, pray for the gifts of the spirit. Pray that you can prophesy so you can edify the church, that you can lead the church in the right direction, that you can help the church. But if you're speaking in tongues, unless you have someone who can interpret speaking in tongues, then no one knows what you're saying. Amen. So this sending forth was the work of the spirit rather than the church. This was the Holy Ghost that sent them forth. This wasn't the church that sent them. From the text, it appears that both sent them. Amen. But the Greek words are different. Indeed, they were sent forth. Ekpemphethentines is the Greek word. Ekpemphethentines by the Holy Spirit. Whereas they were released. The Greek word for released is apolusin. Apolusin, apolusin, apolusin by the church. This word denotes a releasing from any tie, whether contract or relationship, such as the contract of marriage through the through divorce. Amen. The church released them from their ministry at Antioch, but the Holy Spirit sent them. Amen. Now, verse seven which was the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulius, a prudent man who was called for Barnabas, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God from them. This was a Roman ruler over the island of Cyprus. He becomes one of Paul's first prominent converts. Though translated deputy, Luke's words call him a proconsul, which the Greek word is Anti antipatos, because Luke is the author of the of, of the book of Acts. Proconsuls normally were formerly former Romans senators who had been commissioned by the Senate to govern the affairs of the peaceful provinces throughout the Roman Empire. Over more turbulent provinces, provinces, the emperor himself would send legates like Cyrenus and Quirinus and Syria Quirinus that sounds like a, a brother named Quentin Quentin Salmon I actually had a dream about him he was a brother uh, that I went to high school with he's in prison now I actually had two dreams back to back about two brothers that I knew very closely that are in prison for life now one brother name is Roger Harper he killed his girlfriend and now he's serving life in prison. And Quentin Salmon, he uh, dressed up as a as a female uh, Muslim, you know, covered and garbed up, and went and killed these brothers uh, at a dice game. It was over a dice game. That's why you shouldn't be casting lots. And I had a dream that this brother Quentin was in my dream, and I was actually building a stage in my father's backyard. And I was, and it was another brother in my dream. He, he goes by the name China Man, and um, and China Man um, was with me while I was building a stage. Uh, in my father's backyard for us to perform salvation music. And Quentin came out of nowhere and he just walked through, walked through the crowd of people that was, you know, building. And he just like bumped me real hard. And like he bumped me so hard, I did like a 360 turn. You know what I'm saying? I did a whole 360 turn. I remember he had twins by a sister named Dominique, but the, I don't I don't know if the, I don't know what happened to the twins. Um I don't know if they made it. God forbid. Uh if, you know I don't know. I don't I don't want to speak too much on that but uh the brother quentin was in my dream so i was so mad at him that he had bumped me like that and i you know sometimes you just got to turn your cheek man because sometimes when you retaliate it can end up in bloodshed and i remember i turned around and i pushed him you know what i'm saying and and, and i ain't pushing that hard but he he he, I, he he he's a small little guy and he uh he fell and I mean, he bust his face all up and, and this is in my dream and his he turned around and his whole face was bloody and I'm like, dang, I hope he's all right in prison. I hope ain't nothing happened to him in prison. I don't know. The Lord be speaking to me in, in my dreams. He be giving me a lot of night visions. I every day I go to sleep, I dream. I don't go, I don't, I don't go, I don't sleep without dreaming. Every time I'm having a dream. The Lord is his hand is on me heavy. You know what I'm saying? And um sometimes when I don't wrap my locks up, 
I have even the dreams is more vivid. So sometimes I leave my locks out and I don't even wrap them up so I can so I can really um, overstand the dream. It's something it's something mysterious with locks with my with, with the locks. You know, like how the Lord carried Ezekiel by his locks in a vision in Ezekiel eight three. So, uh, so the brother Quentin, he, and, you know, I'm still talking about the dream real fast. So the brother Quentin, after he wiped the blood off his face, he came to me and, and you know, charged at me and, and, you know, like tackled me and we fell off the stage into the grass in my dad's backyard. My dad is on Upsell street in Philadelphia. So this, the stage was being built in my dad's yard. I, I hope, I hope nobody's trying to, uh, uh, stage something that's going to frame me. <laughs> so, uh. So, so uh, we got, we was rustling and stuff and I'm telling Quinn, like, look, stop. I don't want, I don't want to hurt you. I'm telling him I don't want to hurt you. I always knew my own strength. Even when I was fighting, I got into a lot of fights just because I was light skinned. I'm a light skinned black man. So people always wanted to challenge me. You know what I'm saying? I used to fight all the time growing up. It, it didn't make no sense. You know, my mother named me Malcolm. But sometimes they called me white boy growing up. And I, I wasn't, look, my mother ain't named me white boy. And I will not accept that name. My name is Malcolm. You're going, and you're going to remember my name. You know what I'm saying? Amen. Malcolm Khalib, Caleb. You know what I'm saying? So uh, the brother Quentin, uh, he didn't want to listen. He kept, you know, trying to, he kept trying to fight me. So I ended up throwing him on the roof. I roofed this man. I, th <laughs> I threw him on the roof. You know, my dad got, there's a three story uh, house that my dad got. I threw this man all the way on the roof. And then I and then I I ran away, you know what I'm saying? And, and got I hopped in the car and tried to start this car up. And the car act like it went, you know, the ignition went and turned over. I finally got that joint to turn over. And he came. I threw him on the roof real safely. Like he landed on his feet on the roof. You know, you know, dreams is crazy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I mean? I threw him on the roof. He landed on his feet. And then he came down and you know, and he was like chasing me. Like it was like it was like something out of uh, the Matrix. It was like I was in the Matrix. Like like Keanu Reeves, you know, Neo running from. Running from um, Agent Smith or something like that. You know what I'm saying? It was crazy, man. So um, I ended up waking up from that dream. And um, uh, one of the other brothers that was in, and I had another dream about Roger Harper. Now, this dream was a, this was one of those, one of those, you know, one of those dream, one of those damp dreams. And, you know, uh, I, it was, it was uh, some, some seductive activities going on. And he was in the dream. And I don't want to get too much in details in that dream. But that, that dream was crazy. But he was in that dream. And I was like, you know, you know, like, I, I hope he's all right. I don't know what's going on, but the Lord is revealing something to me. And I just, I just keep, I pray on it. And I fast on it. Amen. So, yes. And um, so that's, uh, that's the verses right there. So uh, verse, let's go into uh, verse three, where it says, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now, this is talking about ordination to be ordained. They was ordained, you know, also by the church and ordained by the Holy Spirit. This act is symbolic laying, laying of hands on a candidate for the ministry. As my grandfather used to lay hands on me all the time in peaceful holiness church and anoint our heads. He used to anoint our heads with oil. He used to pour oil on our heads and, and wipe it on our, he used to pour it on the top of our head and he used to wipe it on our foreheads. And he would anoint us and pray over us with, uh, with, with all the elders of the church. They would be laying hands on us. And this was when I was 10 years old, 13 years old, 14, 15 years old. And now I'm 35 years old here kicking out this message, the word of God by way of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. After he has examined, been examined by the church and it has been verified that he is called by God and equipped to provide leadership for the church. Following ordination. He is generally recognized to lead the church in ministry, to determine its soundness of doctrine, to administer its ordinances, and to educate its adherents. Um, I had uh, re got baptized recently over here in Ghana because I, I, you know, you only need one baptism, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, above all, and in you all, and through you all. Amen. And, um, so, but I wanted to get baptized again from from my backsliding days when I was. You know, following the doctrine of Dr. York, you know, until the Holy Spirit gave gave me witness and gave utterance and, and convicted me and showed me in his word how 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 utterly wrong I was in the spirit of error and guided me in the spirit of truth as the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. Amen. That ye need not that any man teach you, but the whole that same that same anointing with the, which abideth in you, uh, you know, abideth in you teaches you all things. First John two twenty seven. Amen. 
So the Holy Spirit had convicted me and put me back on the straight and narrow path. That path that I originally was on that my grandfather and my grandmother showed me. Pastor Curtis C. Smith and Pastor Troy Lee Smith of Peaceful Holding This Church. Ordination does not imply the communication of power or authority, but rather recognizes the ministry being called and the gifted by God. As after I was baptized by the pastor, the pastor, you know, he wants me to start preaching inside the church. This is the apostolic church. Apostolic. Now, the word apostolic, uh, that, you know, is you, it's not, you know, that's that word is not in the Bible. Now, the apostles, you know, the, the apostolic church was named after the apostles. So this is a, this is a whole nother denomination that's now being named after the apostleship. But really, the only way is holiness. That is the way. And our church was called peaceful, is called peaceful holiness. And you see that the way of the Lord is holiness in Leviticus 19, chapter 1 and 2, when he says, he told Moses, talk to the congregation and tell them, be ye holy, for I am holy. The Lord God am holy. So we're supposed to be holy. We ain't supposed to get caught up in all these denominations, whether it's Roman Catholic, whether it's apostolic, whether it's Methodist or African Methodist, or whether it is, uh, it's, it's so many, whether it's a uh, Pentecostal, uh, you know, whether it's non-denominational, all these different denominations are all a part of the spell of Christianity, which is antichrist and which is a word, you know, Christianity, antichrist. And that word is not even found in the Holy Scripture. The word Christianity is nowhere in the Holy Bible. It's not in the scripture at all, the word Christianity. And in Christianity, like I said before, it causes denominations. And these denominations causes separations. That's why you got all these different churches. You got a brother going to a Roman Catholic church. You got a brother going to an apostolic church. You got a brother going to a Pentecostal church. You got a brother going to a Methodist church, African Methodist church. All these different denominations causes division of the church, of uh, the bride of Christ. And it's only one church. It's only one church. It ain't supposed to be divided. So when I do start preaching inside that church, if and when I do start preaching, I'm going to set I'm going to set the record straight. Amen. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now in the Old Testament, God's servants were anointed with oil before undertaking a work to which he had called them, like David was anointed by the prophet Samuel. Samuel was a general, he was a prophet, he was a, he was a war hero. You know what I'm saying? Samuel, go go back and read about Samuel. Samuel was the man. You know what I'm saying? We, you know, when by the time Samuel anointed David, he was older. But Samuel was a war general. He was a general. He was a leader. He was a prophet. He was a saint. He was a Nazarite. You understand what I'm saying? Samuel was the man. And Samuel anointed Saul and he anointed David. And David was the man. You know what I'm saying? David was a was a, not just the man. Da David was a man after God's own heart. You know what I'm saying? Hallelujah. David was a man after God's own heart. Under the Seeky of Yeshavallah. David was a man after God's own heart. The practice of laying on of hands was a biblical act of identification and the accreditation, the accreditation, and was practiced by New Testament Christians and the initiation of ministries. Amen. Jesus taught that all Christians are ordained to bear fruit and have their prayers answered. Amen. John 15, 16, first reference, Numbers 28, 6, primary reference, Acts 13, 3, and Malachi 3, 10. Amen. When uh, the prophet Job had prayed for his friends for their deliverance, he had prayed for them. The Lord was entreated by that. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you have to pray for your friends and you have to pray for your enemies. You have to pray. You know, Jesus taught us, love thy enemies. He taught us, turn thy cheek. And that's exactly what Chris Rock did. When Will Smith smacked Chris Rock, Chris Rock turned his cheek. That was so humiliating. He did exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ told us to do. I, I can feel the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah! I can feel the chills coming on. Glory be to God. Amen. He said, turn our cheek. That's what he said. Amen. So, um, yeah, we're we get, we getting ready to, to, to move right along. Cyprus in uh, verse four of thirteen, Cyprus is a large island in the north east, east the northeast corner of the Mediterranean. We we covered that right there, okay. So yeah, so this was a, this was a this was a lot to absorb and take in. I pray that you um, take all of this in. I pray that that your heart is blessed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you get get, get the utterance of that word in the name of Jesus Christ. 
And um, we'll also go into uh, and close out, and we'll go into uh, Isaiah 65. Some some other things that I wanted to uh, share with you. I'm turning the pages. Bear with me. You hear me turning the pages of the Holy Scripture. Amen. So before I before I uh, jump jump into Isaiah, I want to share something with you. Just uh, this is dealing with uh, Lelibella, Lelibella. You know. So who? Built Lelibella in Ethiopia. Now this ties into what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where he said, Upon thou art Peter, and upon this rock I built my church. Now, who built Lelibella in Ethiopia? Now, Lelibella in Ethiopia is a, is a, is a church. It's 11 churches. 11 rock mound churches. Three story high buildings. And if you look at it from an aerial view, it's, it's, it's the shape of cross. These churches are shaped like crosses. And it was carved out of rock. Carved out, carved out of solid rock. And, and, and it's amazing. This place is holy. And it makes me think about when Jesus said, upon this rock, I build my church. It makes me think about when Jesus said, I go, I go, I go to my father's house where there are many mansions. And I go prepare a place. Now, for those who are... Um, unfamiliar with Lelibella. Lelibella, Lelibella is a famous town in Ethiopia that's home to 11 rock carved churches. The 11 churches represent the 12 apostles, you know, the followers, the disciples, minus Judah Iscariot because he committed suicide. The 12 apostles of Jesus during his time on earth. Now, the town formerly known as Roha was named after the Ajway king, Lelibella. Now the story goes that at his birth, a horde of bees stayed near him and never once stung him. His mother took this as a holy and important sign and named him Lelibella, Lelibella, which means bees who protect him. King Lelibella was a religiously devout Orthodox Christian. I remember it was this girl named uh, Mero, Meron who was from Ethiopia. We went to go see the movie, The Passion of Christ. She was an Orthodox Christian. And she told me how the Ark of the Covenant is still in Ethiopia to this day. Ethiopia is a very holy place. You know, it's very holy. They even have their own uh, calendar where... They're, the year that they are in is different from the year that most people that we're in. We're in 2022. I think they're in like 20, they're in 2014 and 2015. Look it up. What is the year in Ethiopia? Look it up in, in Google and do a little more research on it. Now, King, King Lelibella, uh, he was, he was, he, he was a, you know, a religiously devout, uh, Orthodox Christian. And he made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and spent vast amounts of his time engaged in prayer and fasting and scripture reading and liturgy liturgy amen and after jerusalem was captured by saladin in 1187 ad king lelibella was distraught and decided to create a new jerusalem in his kingdom he thus commissioned the rock hoon churches of lelibella the churches are laid out in a manner that replicates the layout of Jerusalem. Even more impressively, each church is carved from a single gigantic rock. The conventional belief is that these churches were actually built over several decades or a century rather than entirely within Lelibella's reign. But local belief goes that angels divinely intervened and personally helped the artisans carry and chisel the stone. And a few theorists think they were built by aliens. What do you people think? What do you all think? What do you saints think? What do you believe? I think maybe Jesus came and helped out with that one. 
because he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And these are 11 rock churches, 11 churches built out of rock. This is serious. This is something very serious. So that's something to think about and ponder on. Just want to add that on because it goes along with the whole ministry. Amen. Now, and we're going to close out with the new heavens and a new earth. Out of Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17 through verse 25. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Wow. It's going to be a new, it's going to be new heavens, plural heavens and a new earth. Lights out. The lights just went out. Ain't that something? So it's going to be a new heaven and new earth. Hallelujah. I feel your presence, Lord. I feel your presence. Glory be to God. God, get ready. The rapture, is, the rapture is coming. We don't want to be left behind. Isaiah said, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall be remembered, shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. Verse 18, but be ye glad and rejoice for in that which I create for behold, I create Jerusalem and a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Verse 20. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that have not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. Wow. So you still going to be a uh, the infant is still going to be an infant at 100 years old. It's going to be, you know, ba all the babies that was murdered, all that, you know, the innocent babies that was aborted, all these children will be in the new earth in the 1,000 year millennial rule. For 1,000 years, Christ will reign on earth. And there will be 1,000 years of peace. And King David will be, will be resurrected. And he will reign as a king. In the new Jerusalem on earth for the in that new earth for 1000 years that that 1000 year millennial reign King David will reign as king as like a regional governor and you can refer to is in many many different books we'll, we'll cover that topic the next one we'll, we'll we'll do that one next that will be the next the next one God willing God willing Jehovah willing and the babies babies uh, infants, let's read that again. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that have not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old. A child. You'll still be a child at a hundred years old. Ain't that something? But the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. Verse 21. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of of them they shall not verse 22 they shall not build and an, they shall not build and another inhabit they shall not plant and another eat for as the days of a tree are the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the works of their hands so you see how a tree can be there for generations you got trees they last longer than the, the human lifespan my grandfather, courtesy Smith, he's resting in Christ until, you know, the rapture comes and he'll be taken up in the holy city and hopefully will I. Uh, he died at 74 years old. He was about to be 75. 
He, he almost he almost made it to 75. He died at 74 years old, which to me that's that's still very young. That's like a baby. That's still young to me. I think 74 years old is young. In Genesis 6:3 it says, "My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is flesh indeed. Yet his days shall be 120." Amen. So we was given, man was given 120 years to live, but it's things that we do, you know, the smoking, the drinking, the doing drugs, the fornication, living hard lives is what uh, take away your lifespan. Now, women naturally outlive men because they have extra telomeres. The woman is XX and, 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 the, man, and the man is XY. So the man is miss, missing a telomere. The man is missing a telomere. That's genetic information. That's 2.8 percent less than the xx chromosome that's one fourth of eight different parts because if you count all 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 uh each stem that makes up the xx chromosome if you count each stem or each telomere that's eight parts so the man is missing a telomere he's missing a stem the man is xy the woman is the woman is xx so thus women have extended lives. They actually outlived men. My grandma she just made it to 90. My grandfather he died at 74. And my grandma is 90 now. So look how much longer she has outlived, outlived him. But she will meet with him again. Amen. Verse 22. No, verse 23. But we'll recap 22. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. So the elect will enjoy this 1,000 year millennial reign of peace. 100 years old, you'll still be considered a baby. You're only 100 years old, you're just a baby. You know, nowadays 100 years old is old. My grandmom is 90, she, she's, she's, she's old now. But in, you know, in, in 1,000 year range, 100 years old, you're still a baby. You know what I'm saying? It's another, it's in another verse of the scripture, it says that they will build houses and not live in them. Or they will plant vineyards and not uh, drink the wine from them. But here in verse 22, it says, they shall, they, they shall not build and another inhabit it. Meaning, if they build, somebody else ain't going to have it. They're going to they gonna inhabit what they build. They shall not plant and another eat it. Meaning, what they plant, they will eat. Not, another ain't going to eat it. They're they going to eat it. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. So as long as a tree lives, that's how long people are going to live. You know, you know, trees live hundreds and hundreds of years. Trees be like 500 years old. Trees and a thousand years old. Oh, these trees, some of these trees in Africa have been around for 2000 years. Trees. So it says that as the day that it says for as the days of a tree are the days of my people. And mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hand, hands. Amen. They shall not labor. Amen. It says they shall not labor in vain. Let you let it, let us not labor in vain. Amen. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth trouble, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. So. Our offspring will be blessed. And when the rapture happens, those children, if you got children, your children will be taken up too in the rapture. You know, my I got a daughter that's four years old right now. That's my youngest. And I got a seven-year-old. I got two seven-year-olds. I got a four-year-old and I got a 12-year-old. So, you know, all you know, that's my four daughters. And um, and I got two sons that's 12 years old. My grandfather, he had he got he got six children. I got six children as well. You know, I'm, I'm my grandfather's son. You know, I'm my mother's son. I'm Cindy Lou's son. Amen. And um, it says, and their offspring with them. So that's why I said earlier, you know, I will see my grandfather again. I see him in the new Jerusalem when he when he awakes from the slumber of Christ. Right now, he's sleeping in our Lord. He's sleeping in Christ. When he wake up from that rest, when the good Lord come back, oh, he going to wake up. He going to wake up right out of that grave. I was one of his pallbearers. You know, you know, that put him, help put him down in the grave. You know, his grave, his, you know, everybody flew in when my grandfather, you know, passed away in 2008. When he transitioned and went to the, you know, went to sleep in Christ. You know, uh, so many people, they flew in from Hawaii. They came in from Virginia. They came in from California. They came in, uh, you know, they was coming in. He was a blessed man. My grandfather was a saint. 
Amen. He was the Martin Luther King of my family. Amen. And um, verse 24, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. Before you even call, the Lord will answer you. When you even think about it, before you even open your mouth, the Lord will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. You know, the Lord hears. There's been times where I said things in my prayer and instantly it happened. Even, even when I said, when I when I just was read, when I just came to Isaiah and I started to read, I said, For behold, I created new heaven and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. And then it was lights out. There's a blackout over here. I'm, I'm reading using a flashlight right now out of Isaiah chapter 65. I'm at verse uh, uh, 24. I'm at verse 24 where it says, and, and, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. It says, and yet and shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. And as soon as I start out on verse 17, I had my lights on and the light Went out right off of that verse, and I know that's the the Lord is listening. The Lord is watching very close for His eye for for the eyes of the Lord is is ten thousand times brighter than the sun, as as it says uh in um uh, in, in 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 uh in uh Ecclesiasticus the book of Sarah 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 it says that in there. Go check that out. Don't 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 just believe me. Go check it out. Uh, verse twenty five. <clears throat> it says that the wolf. And the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Amen. Verse 65, 17 through 25, we just read that, excuse me, chapter 65 of Isaiah, verses 17 through 25 you know, that's what we just read. At, at this point, Isaiah saw further into the future than any other Old Testament prophet looking beyond the millennial kingdom to the new heavens and the new earth, which you can uh, refer to in Revelations 21. The lights just came back on. Look at that. Look at that. You see how God is working? The light just came back on as I'm breaking this down. You know what I'm saying? This is Isaiah seeing. I said Isaiah is seeing further into the future. Than any other Old Testament prophet looking beyond the millennial kingdom to the new heavens and the new earth. Revelations 21 that we, we covered that yesterday. Thus, the reader is suddenly thrust into the celestial future of the new Jerusalem. Weeping and crying shall be no more. Revelations 21 4. God shall wipe all the tears from their eyes for the former things are passed away. Amen. Amen and amen. So I pray that uh, you're getting all this, all this good revelation knowledge. Amen. So this is, uh, this is, this is good stuff right here. This is good word. This is good doctrine. This is good scripture right here. Amen. We got to, we got to grow. We got to be growing in grace and, and we got to be grounded in truth. Amen. And we got to be mindful of these, you know, false prophets and, and teachers. Amen. We got to live in the hope of the Lord's coming. Amen. Amen. So we'll close. We'll get ready to close out and, and have the benediction. I have another testimony. This was uh, on May fourth. On May fourth, uh, I was actually uh, reading, and um, on May fourth, I was reading in chapter five of the book of Revelations. Excuse me. I was reading in chapter four. I was reading in chapter four of the book of Revelations, and this was May fourth. And as I got to verse five of chapter four of Revelations, a mighty, mighty thunderstorm came into Ghana. I mean, it had people afraid. You had people was hiding in closets. I heard, you know, people gave me their, their stories, how they hid under the bed because people's doors were opening and shutting. The spirit of the Lord had fell down on, on Ghana. And that day I actually happened to be reading the word. And two songs fell into my heart that I didn't even record in the studio yet. This is going to be on Ink Pen Guardian Volume Twelve. Ink Pen Guardian Volume Eleven is is it will be it will come out in four days on the fifth of September, twenty twenty two, Labor Day. Ink Pen Guardian Volume Eleven, the Bridal Chamber comes out. But I'll start to record Ink Pen Guardian Volume Twelve, and um, I have a song on there called Around God's Throne. 
And as I was reading out of Revelations chapter 4, when I got to verse 5, it started being thundering and lightning and the wind started blowing so seriously that it, it was scary. But I wasn't afraid because I knew what I was doing. I, was, I, I wasn't afraid. I was ready. I was ready. I was ready for the Lord because I, I was in the word. I was already fasting. I was ready. This was May 4th. This was May 4th. This was 5-4. And I, and I, and I had got to four or five verse, verse five out of chapter four of revelations. And let me, let me go back over that. And it says, after this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard was as it were a, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be after hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. That's Jehovah. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight, in the sight of, let me read that again. And the, and he that sat was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne and in sight like unto an emerald. Verse four, and round about the throne were four and 20 seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their head crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightning, verse 5. And this one, the thunderstorm came and it was a bunch of lightning on May, on May 4th, which is 5-4. But I was reading out of chapter 4 and I was at verse 5 when the lightnings and the thunders came about. So it was like as soon as I read the word, it manifested in the, in the flesh, in the physical. God's word is eternal and God's word is living. Amen. As it says in Hebrews 4, 12, for the word of God is living and pierceth, pierceth the soul and the dividing asunder is sharp, sharper than any, any two edged sword. That's what it says in Hebrews 4, 12. The word of God is living. So any uh, body that calls himself a, a teacher and tells you that the Bible and the Quran is expired, they have the spirit of error and they are a liar. Any teacher, master teacher, whoever, I don't, I don't care. They, they call themselves, you call them master teacher, I call them a master deceiver. If he say that the Bible and the Quran is expired, he has the spirit of error and he is a liar. Amen. And I ain't even trying to rhyme. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. That's verse five. And that's when the thunderstorm came on that verse, just like the lights just went out when I was reading in Isaiah and I talked about a new heaven and earth. And then I, and then it came back on when I talked about, you know, God will answer you before you even speak. He will, he will know what's in your mind. And the lights came right back on. This is how God works. This is the word. God is God is omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's he's all he's everywhere. He's in all and above all. So you got you got master teachers that that teach that. The most high was appointed by the all. That's that's folly. That's 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 the spirit of error. Ain't nobody appoint the most high. The most high always was. The most high is above all. Is in you all. He's the father of all, in you all, and above all. So ain't no all appointed the most high. Are you are you lost your mind? Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had the face of a man and the fourth beast like a flying eagle. And the verse eight and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him and they were full of eyes and they rest not day and night saying, holy, holy, holy Lord God almighty, which was, which is, and is to come. Verse nine. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, 
Verse 10, the four and 20 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, verse 11, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So all things were created for the pleasure of, 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 of his holiness, and his name is holy. He is the holy reverend. Amen. So John was in the spirit when he saw these four beasts. You know, all of heaven worship the father. The angels extol his character. The elders worship him. The elders fall down and worship and praise the most high God. And their remnant is all white, white remnant. So you have pastors that were saying, uh, not even pastors, excuse me. You have false master teachers that, that call themselves. He said he's the, he's the 19th of the 24 elders. If you're the 19th and the 24 elders, you should be up there falling down, worshiping and praising God up in heaven. And you shouldn't be in, in prison for 20 years going. Amen. So don't let nobody, don't let nobody deceive you. The very elect will be deceived. Amen. So we're going to close out with the benediction. Amen. Benediction. Let's, let's get it. I pray that you are blessed. I pray that you, are, you, you, you got this message. Amen. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. As the people of God say, amen and amen and amen. Go with God.